Hi ladies, today we're going to be going through the process of meiosis. So a couple of different vocabulary terms you need to be comfortable with. Number one is heredity. This is just the transmission of traits from one generation to the next. Meiosis basically sets up organisms to be able to transmit their traits from one generation. So they need to produce the proper cells to in order to do this. So um, genes, okay, the units of heredity, okay, different segments of DNA. We're going to be referring to genes throughout this, this um, screencast. Um, you also need to be comfortable with a couple of different types of cells. So when genes are passed to the next generation, they're passed through gametes. So meiosis is how gametes are cre created. Um, gametes have one set of chromosomes. Um, when we were talking about mitosis, we were talking about somatic cells. Somatic cells have those two sets of chromosomes. So we're going to be talking about gametes and how gametes are formed. Uh, when we are looking at where the specific position of a gene is on a chromosome, we're going to refer to the locus. Okay, so let's start with meiosis. Basically, the whole purpose of meiosis is to reduce the number of chromosomes um, from diploid to haploid. So um, these gametes need to have half as much DNA, so that way when two gametes fuse together, a diploid cell will be created again. Okay? It's really important to have half the amount of DNA, so that way you don't have too much DNA when you're trying to reproduce. So haploid cells have a single set of chromosomes. Diploid sets um, have two sets, or what we call, they have homologous chromosomes. Uh, we refer to haploid with N, and we refer to diploid with 2N. Okay, so another, a good way to think about if you have a diploid cell or not is to think about if you have homologous chromosomes present. So homologous chromosomes have the same length, they have the same shape, they have the same genes, okay? Um, and they may just have different versions or different alleles of those genes. Okay, so if we look here, okay, I have um, sister chromatids and one duplicated chromosome. Okay, this is from, from dad. Okay, this one's from mom. Okay, right here, the, this would be a homologous set of chromosomes, same size, same shape. Okay, this would be a homologous set of chromosomes, same size, same shape, same genes. Maybe this one has the gene for dimples on it. Okay, maybe dad is has the allele for dimples. Maybe mom doesn't have the allele for dimples, but this gene is still present. Okay, so same size, same shape, same genes. Those are homologous chromosomes. <laughs> So when we look at chromosomes in human cells, typically we, we use a karyotype, so just an ordered display of these chromosomes. So you can see um, all the different homologous chromosomes that are present in the cell. So here I have, um, you can see this is a zoom in of like just one of those chromosomes, looking at the first chromosome. Um, okay, one from mom, one from dad, okay, same genes, possibly different alleles. Uh, when we're looking at karyotype, it's often that we talk about them and what what they do. So our autosomes would be um, all the 22 pairs of our chromosomes um, that control basically, that basically do pretty much everything we need in our body. Um, but we also have some sex chromosomes, just the X and the Y chromosome. They're special. Um, and if you're a female, you have two Xs. If you're a male, you have an X and a Y. So basically the sex chromosomes determine what sex you are going to display. <laughs> Autosomes basically account for everything else. Okay, so when we're looking at the process of meiosis, we break it down into two parts, meiosis one and meiosis two. Basically during meiosis one, um, homologous pairs of chromosomes are going to separate. So the homologous pairs, okay, those homologous chromosomes are gonna get together and they are gonna separate during meiosis one. Okay, so right here, my DNA is duplicated. I have my homologous chromosomes, one from dad, one from mom. They get together early on in meiosis one, and then they separate. During meiosis two, this is going to be the, the separation of sister chromatids. Okay, so I have one sister chromatid. Okay, it's going to be pulled apart to make two unreplicated chromosomes, okay, which will allow me to have cells that have only um, one set of chromosomes and which makes them haploid. Okay, note that they can all be very genetically different cells. So four genetically different cells are going to be produced. Let's go through um, how this happens. Before we start with meiosis, there's a couple of vocabulary terms that are important to know. Number one, synapsis. Okay, this is uh, when homologous chromosomes loosely pair up. Okay, and a line, uh, they form a tetrad. 
Crossing over is when non-sister chromatids are going to exchange segments of DNA at the chiasmata. So let's look at these, um, how they take place. So this is the whole process, meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. Remember that meiosis 1 is when um, homologous chromosomes are going to separate. Meiosis 2 is when the sister chromatids are going to separate. Okay, look at meiosis 1. So during meiosis 1, um, homologous chromosomes are going to get together, okay, synapsis, um, with their counterparts. So find their homologous chromosome pair. Um, they're going to um, line up, and during prophase one, they can take part in crossing over. Okay, crossing over takes place at the chiasmata, so that's just the place where the DNA crosses over. And this is really important to increase gen genetic variation. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, also during this time, during prophase, um, you have your centrosomes organizing the spindle fibers, moving to opposite poles, the nuclear um, envelope, is going to start breaking down, okay? But the most important thing here is that homologous chromosomes are gonna um, get together in um, synapsis. During metaphase one, homologous chromosomes will line up on the metaphase plate, okay? And um, it'll be really important that um, they are attached properly, so in this place, kind of like a pro-metaphase is when um, the microtubules will attach to the connectochore. Kind of don't see that in this picture. Um, metaphase, they'll line up on the metaphase plate. And then during anaphase, the um, homologous chromosomes will separate, okay? Being pulled to opposite sides of the cell by the spindle fibers. Note that the sister chromatids are still remaining attached to each other. Telophase and cytokinesis is when these two cells will pinch off. Okay, note during, throughout this whole time, there are homologous chromosomes. Okay, so these cells during this whole time are still considered diploid because there are homologous chromosomes present. As soon as I start meiosis two, these cells are now considered haploid, okay, because they only have, they do not have two sets of DNA. They only have one set of chromosomes. Okay, so during meios meiosis two, um, the sister chromatids are gonna separate. So prophase, same thing that happened before. Okay, these steps are very similar to mitosis. Um, during prophase, okay, your centrosomes are going to organize the spindle fibers. Okay, they're going to go to opposite sides. The spindle fibers are gonna start to attach to the chromosomes. You're gonna see the chromosomes very clearly here, the nuclear um, envelope is going to break down. During metaphase, those chromosomes will be pulled onto the metaphase plate. Okay, everything is perfectly, um, so the connectochore is attached at the centromere to the microtubule. During anaphase, sister chromatids are going to separate. So the sister chromatids will be pulled apart at this point. Okay, they'll be pulled to opposite sides of the cell. During telophase, nuclear envelopes will start to reform around those haploid daughter cells. Okay, so these are haploid daughter cells, okay, with unreplicated chromosomes. Just to compare mitosis and meiosis a little bit, very similar, okay, they both contain the same order of phases, similar things are happening, um, DNA replication takes place, which I'm not sure if I mentioned, but DNA replication would take place during um, interphase for both. So before mitosis starts, uh, or before um, the cell division starts, interphase, you'd have DNA replication. Same with meiosis. Before meiosis one, DNA replication would also take place. Um, in mitosis, you have one division. Meiosis, you have two divisions. The only real, one of the really big differences is synapsis takes place in meiosis. So um, there, the homologous chromosomes get together. Whenever um, mitosis is finished, you'll have two daughter cells. These daughter cells will be genetically identical. So genetically identical, which is really important. Um, with meiosis, one of the goals is actually to produce four daughter cells that are haploid. And these daughter cells are going to be genetically different. Okay, they're going to be very different. Okay, and these will be gametes that can be used for reproduction. Okay, 
So the last thing we're going to talk about is genetic variation, why genetic variation is so important and how it is created through meiosis. So genetic variation um, can arise through mutation. Okay, so any change in the organism's DNA can create genetic diversity. This is particularly important if it actually happens in the gametes. So in any point during um, gamete formation, if there are, is a mutation to the, DNA, the organism's DNA, that is going to change and produce possibly new alleles, um, new versions of the gene that can be passed on through generation to generation. Also, the behavior of the chromosomes during meiosis and fertilization can create variation. So we're going to look at independent assortment, crossing over, and random fertilization. With independent assortment, homologous pairs of chromosomes are going to, um, when they line up on the metaphase plate, it's random. So they could line up like this with um, just paternal on one side, maternal on the other. Okay, or they could kind of flip-flop, having some paternal on one side, some maternal on the other. Remember that when they line up on the metaphase plate, okay, during anaphase, they're going to be pulled apart. Okay? What happens is that you can get all these different variations. So I could get combination one, having gametes that just have paternal chromosomes in them. Combination two, just maternal chromosomes. Or combination three, a different variety of maternal and paternal in each of the gametes. Okay, there's a lot of different varieties. And um, for humans in particular, because we have 23 chromosomes, that means there's 8 million possible combinations of the chromosome when they line up on the metaphase plate. Crossing over can also produce um, more genetic variation. So because, uh, so when um, the homologous pairs um, are in synapsis, the crossing over can take place at the chiasmata. And this can allow chromosomes to swap a little bit of DNA. So DNA can be swapped between the maternal and paternal um, chromosome. And this creates recombinant chromosomes. So they're completely different from the initial chromosomes that went into meiosis. So you can get all these different variations of different chromosomes that carry different genes than um, the parents before had. So this is really um, a really interesting way to add in more variation. And the last way to add in variation is a random fertilization. So um, because any sperm can fuse with any ovum, okay, an unfertilized egg, you can create a lot of different variation with just the, the two gametes that are coming together. So in humans in particular, okay, because there's 8.4 million possible chromosome combinations from independent assortment, okay, putting that together with for both sexes, okay, that means you have 70 trillion diploid combinations that you can create. That's why um, humans all look so different. Even within a family, you can see differences. But um, across our whole species, there's so many differences um, in, a, in like appearance, in different traits, in different um, enzymes, and different characteristics of all the of all humans. So the last thing I want to talk about is the evolutionary significance of genetic variation within a population. So basically, natural selection is going to favor um, genetic variations that are better and enable that organism to survive in their environment. So when um, all these different new variations are produced, either through mutation, crossing over, independent assortment, um, or just random fertilization, okay, this is going to create a lot of novel phenotypes. Some are going to survive more than others, um, and that is going to cause our population to change over time. Um, with sexual reproduction, two parents are giving rise to the offspring. Okay? With asexual reproduction, a single parent is going to pass genes to the next generation. Um, asexual reproduction is less expensive. Okay? You don't need to find a mate. You don't need to do any of that. But at the same time, there's no new variation that's arising, okay? Um, with sexual reproduction, there's new variation arising. So if the environment does change, okay, and they will have, um, that species will have so much variation that there has to be one possible organism that's able to survive and carry on the line. So even though asexual reproduction is less expensive, sexual reproduction provides the variation that allows um, a species to survive longer. So overall genetic variation in sexual reproduction is evolutionary advantageous. Okay, um, please watch the meiosis video uh, next to this one on haiku, and please bring questions to class with you. Have a nice day, girls.